All right. Well, we're just about here at uh, start time. We'll get started here in a few seconds. I suspect we uh, will keep filling up. Actually, it'd be gr ideally if uh, uh, it didn't keep filling up. I'm kind of worried about uh, not having enough seats for everybody, but more on that in a second as we get started. And uh, actually, maybe I'll just uh, start now and uh, give a little forewarning here that there should be four sheets of papers or four grouping of papers. Uh, starting with this one, it'll look something like this for those of you who already got it and those who are about to get it. This is the syllabus, so I'll give that a chance to get to you. Um, following behind that will be a second sheet, will look like this. This is your, your first uh, bundle of homework, I'll call it here, but this is your homework assignment. So hopefully in a few minutes you'll get one of those. Yeah, come on through. Make yourself to the back. I put a bunch of extra chairs against that back wall, so I think you'll fit. Oh, and there, there is one there, and one there, and one there, and one over here. So actually, you three can easily fit with those four, but uh, is, is somebody sitting there, or is that... Yeah, they, okay, maybe they stepped out there. But uh, yeah, as you come on in, make your way towards the back there. There's a bunch of free chairs. I think there's like three... Oh, yeah, thanks. I see there's... Two right here. I'll need to keep that in mind as people come trickling in. All right, um, let's see. That second piece. Third piece, good. It, it, keep passing this all back. Uh, third sheet should look like this. It's just a single sheet. And the fourth one should... Yeah, head, head on back there. There's a couple seats back there. And the fourth and final one is a little bookmark. And that's what I want to get started and go through and welcome you here. So... Um, let me introduce myself first. Uh, I'm Dr. Mike Young. I uh, teach the calculus based physics here and uh, I'm looking forward to get to know you. Uh, most of you have come through um, our Physics 102. Some of you have uh, uh, taken your, I'll call it the uh, introductory to physics uh, somewhere else. Uh, some of you took the 102 with me. I recognize you. Uh, many of you I don't uh, recognize and so I'll get to uh, learn you and uh, your name and this uh, will be together for three semesters of physics 121, 122 and uh, 123. And so I'll begin here by going through the the syllabus. I hope I stalled long enough that uh, maybe it's uh, in the in the back there. Um, I will ask um, we uh, if our numbers work out well and they're looking really good right now. We'll see who else uh, trickles in. Um, but 90 of you should already be registered. 10 of you should be on the wait list. And I'll get you 10 in class for sure. But I'm kind of curious beyond that. How many be are beyond that? That is, you're not even on the wait list. Raise your hand. Okay. Um, Again, I expected a little more than that. That's, that's good. Because I know this is an important semester. Um, if your transfer date is, uh, what would that make it? Fall of 2016. And so I'm going to do everything I can to get you in. I have a, a few strategies and ideas for uh, squeezing extra people in here. And things may be a little tight, particularly in the lab. Uh, but I think it's well worth it for those of you who are obviously trying to uh, squeeze in. Uh, that's a long way of saying we'll stop a few minutes early here on the first day. And if you aren't registered for the class, so if you're on the wait list or not even on the wait list, let's have a discussion here after class here, okay? So the Looks like there's about 20 of you in that uh, category. So again, we'll stop a few minutes early and dismiss everybody else. And then I want to have a discussion uh, with the rest of you and with a, with a game plan. And you'll see when we lay out the syllabus that game plan is already incorporated there. All right, now I think I waited long enough. And so grab your syllabus. Let me take a look at the class. I want to get us started right away because we did have a holiday this uh, first week and so I'm going to start by going to our web page. The first um, 
webpage. You probably recognize that. That's the City College webpage. This one is our physics department, which you may or may not have uh, seen already. This is my link, which goes to my webpage. And if I scroll down to right there, Physics 121, that's you guys here. And so I will click on it. And let's run through this quickly, but together here. And notice then that uh, this is the spring 2015 uh, syllabus. Uh, so I'll start here with the instructor, of course, as I said, here I am, Dr. Mike Young. Uh, here is my office, my office hours. I'll even invite you to come into the lab. This class is broken into three lab sections, and so any day, all day, Monday, you'll be able to find me in lab. Um, one third of you will actually be in lab, but the other two thirds of you will be cycling in and out during the afternoon and into the evening. But as you soon will discover, the labs are a very open time and so I've got this class and another class so I'm in lab a lot and it's PS 117 and so you shouldn't have any troubles uh, finding me sometimes it does get busy and you might have to wait for a few other students to ask questions first but that's one of the best ways to to find me my phone number my email are right there uh, here's a description of the class. I trust you did read this. I will start off here by saying it's mechanics. It's mechanics of solids. It is for the engineer and physical science student. Uh, this is the first calculus-based physics course. So the prerequisite, where does it jump down here to the prerequisite, is physics 102 or some other introductory to physics course. Also, calculus is a prerequisite. So I trust you already know that, that you've taken Calc 1, you're probably in Calc 2, and you've already taken Intro to Physics, whether it be here with our 102 with me or Dr. Kelly, or at your high school, or another community college, or what, whatever there. Uh, I will point out this, and we'll keep saying this as the semester goes along, the goal of this class is very analytic. It is getting the math and the calculations connected. A quick summary of this class is simply say, let's take the physical principle like Newton's three laws of motion that you learned in your physics 102, and then let's take the calculus that you learned in your Calc 1 or maybe even the trigonometry that you learned in well, your trig class, and if you took it here at City College, it would have been math. Is that 138? 138. Yeah. And so 138 together with your, well, and 150 together with the physics 102, and we're going to merge those together. So we're going to take our physical principles, and we're going to take a lot more math, and that's what it's meant up there by very analytical. Uh, we'll start hopefully with very straightforward and easy stuff and then maybe by week 10 you'll see how it has grown. Hopefully not so fast that you feel lost, but by the time we get to week 10 you'll look back here on this first day and say, yeah, that we've come a long way. We started with some real easy stuff and now we've got to some real hard stuff. So like rungs on a ladder, we're going to get higher and higher and higher. Yeah. Is this the attendance or check our names off and pass it around. It's come all the way up here. And oh, um, my, no, what is that? I, let me check this out here. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That, no, that wasn't supposed to go around. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay, I will. Thank you. That, uh, yeah, that must have been on the bottom of that stack of papers I had. Um, let's see, where was I here? Oh, so in here, then um, I will point out then one more thing. It is highly recommended that you also enroll, and you, and you have to actually enroll, in our workshop class, the Physics 121W. Let me take a moment to point out the beige sheet. This explains that class. And since this is your first time in our three semester program, let me explain this class. Uh, it is a class designed to help you in this class. It's Friday afternoon. Uh, we call it a workshop class because as the name implies, it is just a workshop. You go there and you can do the homework for this class. Uh, the instructor there is there. 
Uh, you can ask him questions. He's a really great guy. He's very friendly and he's easy to approach and ask questions to. Um, also, while you're there, you'll get to know other people in this class. You will ask them questions. They will ask you questions. It is our way of getting study communities together and it is very powerful. Actually, Don also does these reviews uh, a day or two before the exam and so uh, when the first exam comes or the second or third he'll say hey uh, how about Sunday afternoon we take about three hours if you want you can come and we'll go over some past tests and work it out. So very very helpful. I have never had a student say it is not helpful. I encourage you to ask around. Is it going to take effort on your part because you've got to actually go sign up? Uh, I have a bunch of ad codes right here for that class and so when we end here today I would encourage anybody who hasn't heard about this class to come in get an ad code and again it's Friday afternoon and it's a one unit course it's credit no credit I and mean, you can't take it for a grade so it's not going to increase or decrease your um, GPA in terms of that class what it will do is increase your GPA for this class did I answer your question it's like you were oh are there any more or did I run short uh, I think we're out um, again Hang around, we'll stop a few minutes early for just that and I can make a lot more copies. Yeah, yeah. Is there going to be a workshop this Friday as well? And they'll, yeah, starting this, this, this Friday. And uh, you can go there with, you know, this first homework assignment. Although, as you'll see in a few minutes, this first one won't be an uh, overwhelming homework assignment. But uh, those days are coming where you'll really appreciate the, uh, the workshop. And so as you'll see, we do a chapter each week with the idea that I know you guys are going to go to the workshop, so I'll you know, explain the material during the week, then you'll go to the workshop on Friday. Um, you may not finish all the homework, probably won't on the workshop, but if you got started before the workshop and kind of got stuck and then get unstuck when you go to the workshop, uh, then you can kind of work through there and then hopefully that'll give you enough momentum to finish up the assignment over the weekend and turn it in on Monday. That's, that's the strategy anyways. Okay. All right, well, I'll keep going unless you guys have more questions here. The textbook. Uh, hopefully you picked up the textbook. Uh, did you guys, at least those of you who are actually enrolled, get my email about the textbook? Okay, here is the book, although let me be careful with this one. This one uh, does not have the uh, uh, modern physics on it. Does anybody have the one with the modern, well, uh, physics on it? But uh, you, this is one of the editions. And so on that email I sent out, this happens to be this copy of the seventh edition. I suppose I should have brought the eighth or the, or the ninth. And it doesn't matter which edition you uh, get. Um, and some of them can be actually quite uh, affordable. Ah, now that's the seventh edition. I recognize the picture, and it's, well, you can see it's a little thicker. But again, the thing I just want to warn you wherever you get the book, make sure it says at the bottom with modern physics. Not that you'll need it this semester, but in 123, you'll need that part, which is why I don't carry the heavier book to this class. But uh, you don't want to buy two books eventually. And so that one book will be good for all three semesters. Uh, the other important piece here is the lab manual. And, uh, oh, I was going to grab my lab manual too. I should have, and I did not. Yes? Yeah, the one I was holding up is the seventh edition. Uh, the eighth edition has some uh, solar panels on, on front of it. And the ninth edition kind of a beige color. Uh, I forget what's on there now, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah, there, there, there's the, uh, yeah, the ninth edition, but yeah. I'm sorry? It covers all three courses? Yes, and the book would cover all three courses. Yeah, yeah. So, like I said, it, it, I think it's a really good buy. If you pick up an older seventh edition or eighth edition for, say, $40, and it's good for three semesters or three classes it's probably one of the cheaper textbooks you'll you'll find in your college career <laughs> when, when done that way yeah yeah because textbooks can get very expensive as you know yeah is there more lab manuals at the 
You say, did they run out? They ran out. Uh, okay, let me check with them. Uh, as you can see, we're, you know, we're got a lot of people obviously interested in more than uh, anticipated. And so they often do run out. In fact, I think they deliberately time it that way that they don't want to overprint and they lose money on it. So they wait until they run out and then they, they print more. So I'll double check with them, but I'm glad you said that. That reminds me then too. I'll probably just make a few extra copies of the first assignment so that when you guys come to lab on Monday, we'll have a backup plan. Yeah, and what to do. Um, in fact, I'll even tell you now when we get into the lab, you team up with a partner and so you only between the two of you you only need one manual really so you know as long as and that's what I'll do first I'll just ask around okay anybody missing one and somebody you know and I'll say okay now let's get you with somebody who has a lab manual so that everybody in that group at least there is at least one lab manual in that group that you can read and do the work from Okay. Um, let me scroll down again, <clears throat> since for many of you, you uh, this is the first time having a class with me, but this is my grading policy for all my classes. During the semester, I give three exams, and those three exams count for a total of 50%, which makes it, you know, 16 and two-thirds percent for each test. Uh, likewise, the end of class is a comprehensive final exam, which is 25% of your grade. So right there, 75% of your grade is exams, in-class exams and final exam. The other 25% is homework, which is 10%, and labs, which are 15%. And they will be graded on effort, not on being absolutely correct. So I view the homework and the labs as part of the learning process. So just like you're going to come to class and take notes and just like you're going to go home and read the book and do the homework, that homework process, 10% of your grade, if you do it, if you try all the problems, or rightly or wrongly, and turn it in, you're going to get full credit. Of course, more importantly, is if you actually try each of them, you will probably do very well on the test and that's the motivation to get you to make sure that you pick up you read the book you try each homework and you put in that effort and so not only will you get your homework a hundred percent correct but then you will probably also score quite high on the test which means I've met my goal of which means you actually learn the material and that's the approach there. Same thing with the labs. Uh, the labs, as you'll see here, we'll be working in the lab and uh, like the lab coming up this uh, Monday is we are going to drop an object down from the ceiling and we're going to watch it fall. We're going to measure its distance, its velocity, its acceleration and all these things involving motion that we're about to get started with here this uh, coming week and so that's what we'll have our discussions on and I would encourage you then to talk with your lab partners and fill out the little tables and make the little graphs and if you have any troubles ask me or ask your partner or ask the group next to you because by, hopefully by the time lab is done you've got the lab a hundred percent correct and you've taken the time and you're going to hopefully leave the lab with that much more information okay and we'll come back to that grading probably after we take the first test. Uh, guidelines for turning in the homework. Your first homework assignment is due on Monday. You'll see here in a few minutes we'll get started with chapter one and I'll send you off and you will hopefully then do chapter one either at the workshop or you know if you don't feel like you need the workshop that this week that's fine. Talk to the instructor Don just send him an email and say I'm good Chapter one's easy, but I want to make sure I'm still in the class. Don't drop me because I know it's going to get harder and, you know, keep my spot there and I will come. But this Friday, I don't uh, feel like I, I need to. Uh, but anyways, this is just how you kind of want to write it out and put your name on it and all those good things. Uh, I better move on since we're kind of short here on time. The next page on your syllabus has the, uh, what I would say, the helpful hints on uh, what 
if anybody comes to me and say I'm, I'm struggling in this class I I don't quite understand what's going on I would say ah let me help you and I will start with are you going to the workshop class uh, because the workshop class by far and away is the most helpful thing you can do outside of class of course other than read the book and do the homework and the obvious things but in addition to that it is go to that workshop class if nothing else you can just sit there and do your homework and you have to do it anyways and you you get it done but it's nice to have somebody there that you know you can ask a question and just just kind of have that uh, dialogue so that's why I put it top on my list it is by far I think the most important thing you can do to be successful in this class uh, beyond that we do have some free tutoring service it's just down the hall PS 112 the hours still have to be set up um, this tutoring service doesn't start till the second week and so this week I'm working out times of when the tutors are going to be there and so next week I'll hand out a little flyer and you can just keep that in your notebook and if you find yourself struggling you can drop into the uh, tutoring service. Uh, another helpful one is uh, our YouTube videos. If you go to YouTube and you type in Santa Barbara City College or SBCC Physics uh, you'll see a bunch of videos including if you noticed we're gonna retape the 121 videos so I got the camera rolling already so right in the back there we've got the cameras if you go there right now <clears throat> you will see these same lectures I think they're three years old if I'm re remembering maybe they're only two but the last time I videoed these uh, these lectures was about three years ago and so I was looking at them and I said hey this might be a good semester to redo those ones and so at the end of each lecture we'll take the recording out and we'll put it into our computer. It takes a while to upload, but today's lecture should be on our YouTube channel by this evening at, at some point here. And so if you miss class or if you tuned out because you got up so early and we're about halfway through a problem and you go, okay, I followed the first half, but I have no clue what happened during the second half of that problem, uh, they're great. You probably aren't going to sit in front of your computer screen for two hours and rewatch a two hour lecture, but you probably are going to say that problem was really complex and I really didn't get it. And so you can just scroll through and get right to that one. I have been told some of my students tell me they watch it at double speed. So I, I, I don't know how that if that if that works, but they say, yeah, it's great. You take a two hour lecture, it becomes a one hour lecture. All right. Mm -hmm. All right as long as you uh, can digest it that uh, quickly. And then there's some other options. I'll leave those alone here. You can read them and and uh, view those other options if you so need them. Uh, the next page here on the syllabus is the homework assignment and so right here chapter one these are the problems for this weekend this other packet right here it looks something like this this is a photocopy of those so you can either keep this or of course they're at the end of chapter one whichever you know works best uh, for you uh, right now you'll see that I have passed out <coughs> excuse me the homework assignment for chapters one through four which is going to bring us up to the first test and so after the first test I'll give you another little packet which will be chapters five six seven and eight and then so forth and so on until we get through the 14 chapters and if I go to the last page here let's just <coughs> look at the last page of your syllabus you will see that it is kind of in a table form the schedule for this semester and what we will be covering so you can see right away in the first row it says week number one we're going to do chapter one that's the goal today to give you the syllabus give you an idea of the class and let's talk about chapter one because you're going to leave here and do chapter one and turn it in on on Monday and of course you already know that Monday was a holiday so there was no lab this week next week we will do the acceleration due to gravity and we will do chapter two <clears throat> as you scroll down you will see that we will finish chapter four right about here um, I did bump the test a little bit further than I kind of liked I mean I, th I th the test would be ideally there but that Monday is a holiday now we could do it on a Wednesday but 
here's my concern and I'm, and I'm glad I did this looking at the number of, of people in here you can see we have some side chairs and the side chairs work fine for a lecture they don't work well for a test on Mondays but Mondays only this room right next to us well we'll call it the overflow room is available <clears throat> and so I'll get another instructor and so on test days we can get everybody spread out a little bit more give yourself a little bit of room we have desks over there we have you know obviously we have I think we have uh, well there's 80 in the center and another 10 I think so we've got 90 in here and we've got some room over there bottom line is for test days we do do need some more room we need to spread out and because of that then our tests need to be on Monday so that's why that one got bumped there but the other ones are also scheduled on Monday uh, but they're at a good spot they're right kind of as we end and so we will end chapter 8 and then have the test uh, we will end chapter 12 and then have the test and then we will have our our final exam okay and in final exam your final exam is scheduled on Wednesday but again we will we will have the overflow on that because that'll be final exams week also Does that make sense any questions Yes, and there's a lab, um, I think every week, let's see, is there any time there's not a lab? Um, week 11. Oh, uh, week 11. Okay, well, that's spring break. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I think there's another Monday. Oh, there it is. Uh, coming up, there's a Monday holiday. So if there's a holiday, we don't have the lab. But if there's a test, we, we, we still have the lab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we do our best there because I know you're going to come in for the test. <clears throat> you've probably been studying all night and now you've just taken a test. So you're physically tired and mentally tired and then you've got a lab to do. But we'll, uh, it's necessary evil, I guess, is what I'm getting at here. All right, well, if there's no other uh, questions for me, then, then I'll begin and say let's go ahead and uh, get started with the class. And uh, that will give us about an hour and a half here to look at chapter one, and that's about right here. And so, I shall begin. When you get a chance to look at chapter one, you will notice right away that most of this material you've seen before. Maybe not all of it, although there's a good chance you, you have seen all of it. In fact, I, I hope you've seen all of it. Because part of the lesson I want to get across to you is to train your brain for thinking through problems. And the day is coming real soon where you will see some challenging problems that you've never seen before. And so, how do you do those? And I think the best way to answer that here is in chapter one to get us started with things you've already seen before. And then let's think about how you would get to that answer. So it's kind of helpful to already know the answer and to think about the process of how you would get there. So I always fear that I'm going to bore students because you already know the answer. But I think in the long term, students get real appreciate of this process of saying, okay, that's how you work through a problem. This is how you solve the puzzle. This is how I get to the end result. So starting very simply with the metric system for our measurements your first section of chapter one is just measurements the system international let's take a look at that and again I know you've been working with the metric system for many years you probably were first acquainted with it maybe in kindergarten maybe even before that and so I'm going to take you back to your pre-kindergarten days and just ask you to kind of remember kind of think about what process did you go through because you probably didn't go through it as analytically as I would like for us to go through now and here's what I mean by that is when we go to make a measurement or in a physics classroom 
really the process starts with trying to understand the physical world. And so somewhere in your lifetime, probably before kindergarten, you probably started asking your first physics questions. It, you didn't probably think of it as physics. You probably didn't even know the word physics. But you wanted to understand the world around you. Maybe it was as simple as mom's going to let me go in the backyard after lunch and play. And I'm going to open that glass door and run to the fence. How far is that? How many steps is it going to take for me to get all the way here from one side to the other and then from one side of my yard to the other side of my yard? And so one of the things that you asked very early was this whole idea of length. And if we go through human history, we kind of find the same thing. Early cave people started asking, okay, how far is it from my cave to your cave? Because I got to get there before those wild animals attack me, right? Or how far is it from this bush that I'm hiding into that antelope over there? Uh, because I've got to catch that antelope before it takes off running faster than I can run or throw a spear at it. And so the kind of those first questions are, what's going on in the world around us? What is the world made out of? Now this is important here because this fits under this idea of this is a quantity. This is what physics is about. Physics is about discovering the world around us. What is going on? Physics is not made by humans. Physics is the world around us and we as humans discover the world around us. And I want to make that distinction here because if I were to use our room as example, let's say I would ask how far is it say from this door to that door? That is a physical quantity. There is a distance from door one to door two. Uh, whether or not I know the answer or whether or not I measure it in units of feet or meters, doesn't change the fact that there is a physical quantity called length. And what I'm really trying to say is imagine no humans ever existed. Would length still exist? Yeah. And so there would be some distance from say the sun to the earth. Now if there's no humans on earth, so be it. There still is a length. There still is a distance. And that's what we're going to be looking for. And that's what I mean by taking you back to before kindergarten. And start with something simple. Is you begin to ask what is around you. And the first one was length. Now, here's where the human side comes into it. Using the metric system, what do we use to measure length? Yeah, the meter. And so I'm sure many of you are already familiar with a meter. And you know, meter is about, you know, yay big here. And so that is a meter. Now that's a human invention, right? How big is a meter is what we as humans define. So be careful here between what is the quantity, which is something that is part of the physical world, and then what us humans design in order to measure that quantity. And that's what I really want to make a distinction. This is the quantity, this is the unit. And of course, we always like to give little symbols instead of spelling out the word length. And so I will give a, a symbol. Uh, you could probably even guess it. Any suggestions? L might work. Good. I won't use that one since your book doesn't. Any other suggestions? D. Sure. Another one you see a lot. We're going to be a little more analytical in this class. So I'm going to put delta x and ask you if you kind of recognize these symbols. Delta, what does that mean? Change. Change, good. You recognize that. X. Yeah, and so you can see I'm kind of grabbing this from a coordinate system and so what you're going to see is we're going to say well the object finished here, this is the final point, this is say the initial point, so this might be x final, this might be x initial, the distance between them would be to take the location of the final point and subtract the initial. Make sense? And so that's going to be our symbol for length. A, a delta x. How far? Now sometimes that will change into a delta y because we might ask not how far is it 
on an x-axis, door to door, but how far is it, say, from floor to ceiling? Okay, fair enough. Like I said, no, nothing too surprisingly new. And I bet you've done this one too. What's the symbol for the meter? Yeah, yeah. So answering my first question here and say, okay, how far is it from this door to that door? I would roughly guess 10 meters. So maybe I'll say delta x is 10 meters. And I guess what I mean by that is a sentence, right? The distance is 10 meters. And so if somebody made the statement, hey, the distance is 10 meters, isn't that how you would write it down? Now, notice you are converting a verbal description to a mathematical description. Now, I wouldn't say it's hard, and I bet none of you have any troubles with saying, hey, the distance is 10 meters, and then you write down that equation. But that's what I'm going to keep emphasizing this semester. That is a skill, an important skill, is how do I change a verbal description into a mathematical description. Because if I can summarize any physics problem, it is usually two big pieces. The first one is there is an explanation or a description of what is going on. And your first big step, I call it the translational step. You've got to take that information. You've got to translate it from words into equations. And the second half of that is now solve those equations. And so that's a big step too. But those are your two big steps. And so you've been learning this over the years, and this one probably seems very simple to you. But I'm sure you've seen other word problems that don't seem quite so simple. But I also would suspect you wouldn't be at this point in your education if you weren't pretty good at those word problems, those people who hate word problems don't usually also elect to take a class that is nothing but word problems. But here you are in a class that every problem will be a word problem. So your first big step is going to be that translation. Uh, let me ask you this too. Why write it as 10M? I mean, why not write it as 10 comma M or maybe 10 semicolon M or maybe 10 colon M. Why do we do this? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself that? What? Ah, good, good. If you didn't quite hear him, and if you haven't seen it this way, let's talk about this for a moment. See, when you said the distance was 10 meters, what you were really saying here is I could take a meter stick and lay it here, one, and then another, and another, and another, and another. And so what you really said is the distance from that door to that door is really a meter stick, and another meter stick, and another meter stick, and another meter stick. And let me not write out all 10. But I would then say that the total distance between those two doors is 10 meter sticks added together. And I know you learned this back in third grade. How do you write repetitive addition? It's multiplication, right? I'm sure back a long time ago, usually about third grade, teacher says, how are we going to write three plus three plus three plus three? And you learned about multiplication. Multiplication is repetitive addition. So that in mind, what this really means then is 10 multiplied by an M. And of course, somewhere probably around sixth grade, you learned 
that if you don't put any operation between them, it means multiplication. So, again, maybe taking you back to your elementary school here, this is important, that you realize that this is 10 multiplied by an M. And here's why. This will start to fit this idea that, okay, early on you asked about length, and I used the example of maybe from your back door out to your fence, but maybe something else went on in your mind. You said, I'm going to go play in that backyard, and I'm going to kick the soccer ball around. I wonder how much room do I have to kick the soccer ball? What are you starting to ask yourself there? Area, right? You, you're, you're asking, I would call, the next physics question. That, that the world is not just one-dimensional. It is not just simply how far is it from point A to point B, but then there is a surface that this soccer ball can go front and back and left and right. And so, without even thinking about it, somewhere along the line, you increased your knowledge of physics from a one-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional problem and you begin to ask how much area do I have here? If it was this room, I may be asking myself not just how far is it from door to door, but if I'm kind of interested in how many students can I get into this classroom, I really want to know how much area do I have, right? It's not just how wide is this room, but how deep is that room? And so, again, I know you've seen this before, especially way back in elementary school, but I want you to see that you've just asked the next question. And today, we're going to keep asking next questions, but they're one you've already seen. Guess what you think will happen real soon? <laughs> yes, we'll start asking, what about next? And we'll go from things like distance to velocities and velocities to accelerations and accelerations to jerks and jerks to forces and forces to energies and energies to, and in this semester we won't quite get to, uh, temperature and charges and magnetism and capacitance and a bunch of other questions we will begin to ask as we go from mechanics to electricity to magnetism. And we start asking that next question. And that's what I want to start feeding on today. What, what do you do? Well, you start asking, what next? And so in this case, I'd say, what next is, how much room do I have in this classroom for students? Just like as a young kid, how much room do I have in the backyard to kick the soccer ball around here? Of course, I would probably choose a symbol for it, and probably not a surprise, we use the capital A, which, by the way, the little a, I'm saving for acceleration, so we'll see that on Monday, so we'll go capital A for area. But now we begin to ask this question, well, how do you figure out how much area is there? How do you measure the units? Of it. Well, let me start with that first one. Okay, I realize that there would be more than just the width of the room. I would also need to know the length of this room. Uh, so let me draw a quick picture here. And again, I'm sure you did this back in elementary school. You were introduced to the idea of area. And you said, well, this room has a width. Oh, but it also has a length. So, how do you get the area of this room? Yeah, and I heard somebody say length times width. But why is it length times width? What if nobody had told you that the area is length times width? And maybe it's too bad. Somebody had already told you that area is length times width. Could you figure it out or reason it out yourself? What are you really saying here? Well, didn't we say there were 10 of these? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And so I'll just draw the t what I'll call 10 boxes here. 
I've got my 10 meters this way and I'll just consider that one row. But wouldn't that happen again on the next row? And the next row? And the next row? And so if I was asking what surface is here, what area is here, how many boxes are here, wouldn't this really be the width and then add it again and then add it again and then add it again? How many times would I add width? Length. And what do we call repetitive addition? Multiplication. And so what that tells me here is this formula for area is length times width. And I know you've seen it before, but what if you had never seen it before? Could you have told me the formula? And that's what I want you to see here today, is that we're going to go through a thought process, and there's going to be four steps along the way. And the first step is, what is the new quantity? What is going on in the physical world that I either knew already or didn't know, but I'm asking the question, there's something new here. That something new can be as simple as area, or it can be as complex as magnetism. And so, what happens next? And once you realize there's a new quantity, the next part of it is, how would you calculate and measure this quantity? And so had you never seen the formula length times width, I'm hopefully you're seeing, I could figure it out. And that's probably the most important thing I can say. In fact, let me take this moment right here to just point out on the very top of your syllabus, and it's on the top of every page, and it'll be top of every test you take, what does it say? Physics is about knowing how to apply a few powerful fundamental concepts to explain a universe of phenomena. You will discover that in the next 14 weeks we spend together, you will learn just six things. Newton's three laws of motion and the three conservational principles. Six sentences. I could repeat them now for you in about two minutes. It's going to be an easy class. That's it. That's the whole final exam. Six sentences. Think you can handle that? But it's what do you do with those six sentences? It's that deductive reasoning. It is that step of saying, okay, yeah, I know what length is. And then I show up for the test and they ask me about area. Area? Where did that come from? We were talking about length in class and now there's a question about area? And the first question says, what is the formula to calculate area? Are you serious? Yes, I am very serious. You can tell me the formula for area if all I told you was about length. Because you can take that next step. That's this whole semester's process. Getting you to think through deductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, deductive reasoning. What happens next. So, like I said, this is a really good chapter to start thinking about that process of thinking, of solving a problem. And so this is how I would come up with the formula, even if I had never seen it before. In fact, I would go one step further. Let's say that the length of this room is also 10 meters. So according to my reasoning here, and let me see if I can find an eraser here. I have just concluded that the equation is length times the width. And the length is 10 meters and the width is 10 meters. So what is the area of this room? Yeah, and here's why it's important then to realize that 10m really meant a multiplication process. Treat it like it is. And when you see that, you'll realize that I, uh, what I can do is put my numbers together and put my units together. And I know you know what 10 times 10 is, it's 100. And I'm hoping you also know what is a meter times a meter. Meter squared. So again, somewhere in your edu math education, you learned how to write repetitive multiplication.
And so this would be the answer for what is the area of this room. But it also answers this question here, what units would make logical sense to measure this new quantity called area? And the answer is square meters. Now again, I know you have already used square meters and square inches to measure area. But did you ever stop to ask yourself why? And I'm hopefully answering that question if you haven't. This is why. This is the only unit that would make logical sense. It's got to be an area, or the unit of area has to be a unit of length times a unit of length. And so I'll say it again. Have you never heard of area? You could have, number one, realized there is a physical quantity called area. Number two, you could have come up with the formula for area. Number three, you could come up with the unit for the area. And the last piece of this puzzle is, what is the meaning of a square meter? Can you, can you give it some kind of physics interpretation? I mean, when you say this room is 100 square meters, what, what, what do you really mean by that? And again, hopefully it's straightforward enough that you could see that isn't one of these boxes a square that is one meter by one meter? So when you say that this room is a hundred square meters, what do you really mean? Well, I guess you mean there is a box that is a square meter. In addition to that, there is a second box that is a square meter. There's a third. There's a fourth, and of course I won't do all hundred of them, but there would be one hundred of these. And so you are saying, I have a square meter one hundred times. And physically what that means is I can lay out a square here, and a square here, and a square here, and a square here, and if I had a hundred of them, I'd fill up this whole room. Fair enough? And so, again, using something you've already seen, area, do you see those four things? I can ask myself a new question and find a new quantity. I can come up with the formula for that new quantity. I can come up with the units for that new quantity. And I can give myself an understanding, a physical interpretation of what that square meter, the units, represent. Let's take the next step. Because I'm sure you would have asked yourself this next idea that, okay, what if I'm more interested not in how many students I can fit in here, but I want to cool the room down or heat it up since it's, well, it's not really cold or hot today, but um, it was cold this morning, so let's go with cold. And I want to warm this building. Okay. Now, to warm this building, I would want to know really how much air is in here, right? And so what am I asking myself? Right, that next question. It's not just how much laying on the surface, but in addition to that, stack those and how high would it go? And so I have gone from length to area, but in the same way, I am now going to ask myself volume. And there would be the next physical quantity. And again, you've already done this way back in elementary school. Um, let me give a symbol that we like to use for volume. We like to use the capital V for volume because the little v we're going to save for Monday for velocity. Okay? And so there is our volume. Now with that said, let me kind of erase the board here and let's go through that same process again. The first part of it is, you know, what's kind of the next question? Well, the next question here is, how much air is in here that I have to heat up? And knowing the length or knowing the area doesn't completely answer it. There is something more to it. It is the area stacked up to the ceiling. And so we'll call it something new. We'll call it volume. Could you give me the formula for volume? How would you get the volume of this room? Well, maybe I'll try to draw a three-dimensional picture here of this room. But given that we already said the walls are about 10 meters by 10 meters, 
What would be the formula for volume? Okay, it is length times width by height, but why? Right, so what I'm really saying here is this would be area, and then I would stack on top of that another area, and I would stack on top of that another area, and I would keep doing that until I got to the height of the ceiling. And so it could be a short distance or it could be a long distance. But how many stacks I make, make that important. And of course that means what I have is area times its height. And as we already said, area is length times width. And so here is my second point and your second time seeing it. If you had never seen the formula for volume, could you have figured it out on your own? And it's okay if you say no. Just it's not okay at the end of the semester if you say no. And that's this whole approach. One step at a time. You ask what's new. What is then that formula that goes with it? And so that's why we're starting here with things you've already seen. And showing you how you probably worked it out or maybe you were too young to work out the formula on your own and you were just told by your third grade teacher this is how you get volume but that's where we want to go beyond we don't want to be told what the formula is if you find yourself going and looking at a problem and you said this problem is asking about how fast the asteroid is moving which I don't think I can answer. I do remember in class the teacher talking about the, the movement of a baseball. But now on the homework it says asteroid. Yeah? That's the point. <laughs> we didn't explicitly talk about the asteroid. But you can figure it out. Because we did do the baseball. And we did a lot of examples with the baseball. And so the homework and the test question won't be a baseball, it'll be something else. But the big principle is I can do any of those motions now that I understood those. So this would be the formula. And in fact, using this room as an example then, we would have our 10 meters by 10 meters, and I'll call it 4 meters up. But as you can see then, if these are all multiplications, the numbers multiply together to give you 400 and the units? Cubic meter. And so what I would call step three here is figuring out what would be the only logical way of measuring volume and it would be in cubic meters. And the best thing about this is I know you have seen cubic meters in the past and I know you already know that it measures volume. But had you never seen it before, you see how you would work it out? And let's go to step four. Step four is what does this mean then? We're all said and done. We started with this new question which came up with a new quantity. That led to a new formula that I came up all on my own that then proved to me what the units would have to be even though there is nowhere in the book or no teacher who told me what the units are I figured it out and now my last piece is now that I'm here at this point and I say that the volume of this room is 400 cubic meters what does that mean to me? well a cubic meter and a cubic meter and a cubic meter added 400 times. That's what it means, right? And so what does a cubic meter mean? Well, I guess coming back over to here, a little box that is a meter by a meter by a meter. And you can imagine this box actually is pretty close to that size. I'll pick it up, or at least imagine picking it up. Put it right here. Here is my first box. And I can go all the way across and get 10 of them. And then move over and go another 10. And move over and get another 10. And I get all the way to the back of the room, I have 100. 
And then I'll put another box on top of that and go all the way back. That's 200, 300, 400. And so what I mean by this is I would have 400 of these boxes that are measured a meter by a meter by a meter would fit into this room. Okay? Well, I think you're seeing my point. I'll shift gears a little bit here. But you can see how one idea leads to another idea, leads to another idea, leads to another idea. Oh, let's go back to our basics here. So, okay, I said one quantity here was length, and from length we got area and volume. But we could ask other things. Let's say that I already know it's 10 meters from this door to that door, and I decide I'm going to walk from that door over to this door. And I may change the question a little bit. How much time is it going to take me? Because that's the other curious thing. If we go back, you know, to like I was saying, the early cave people, they're hiding in the bushes. I mean, they want to know what is the distance to the antelope. And of course, they're also saying, well, how much time will it take me to get there? Because obviously you're going to spook the antelope and obviously it's going to start running and you've got to get close enough to throw the spear at it. So the question is distance, but the question is also time. Well, well, there it is. There's, there's a new quantity right there. One that you've been working with before you were in kindergarten, right? Time. Again, time is some physical quantity. It's not something that's human made. I know most of us, when we measure time, we look at a watch or our cell phone or some kind of device that keeps track of time. But time, like 24 hours, is what it takes for the Earth to spin once on its axis. So if there were no humans on Earth, would there still be time? Yeah. And I think that one's maybe a little bit harder to see than length, but time is not a human invention. It's part of the physical world. And so it would take what we as humans call one year. If there were no humans, I guess we wouldn't call it one year, but there's a certain amount of time it takes for the Earth to go all the way around the sun. Well, we as humans invent the word year for that, but that quantity time is separate from humans. So I would say there is another quantity that you already know in the physical world. Um, I'll put the symbol up here that your book uses and probably doesn't surprise you. It's a lowercase t. Uh, I'll even put the units. We as humans invented a unit to measure time. You're probably already familiar with the idea of a second. And your author does a good job of giving you the modern definition of a second. The original idea of a second, I think you know, is that one revolution is 24 hours. Uh, you divide that by 24, you get an hour. You divide an hour by 60, you get a minute. You divide that by 60, you get a, a second. Unfortunately, the Earth doesn't always keep the same rotational speed, so it's not a good long-term definition. And so instead we have the cesium atom and however many billions of times the atom oscillates there is, or the electron uh, orbits there is our new definition of a, of a second. But I'm not real interested in the, at this point anyways, the, the strict definition of what a second is. What I'm interested in is see how that would be a new question with a new quantity, okay? And it would be what we'd call a fundamental quantity, kind of like length. We start here and then things can build from there. But there is time. I'll, maybe I'll give one more for this chapter. Uh, you can see where we're headed. What if I put this question together? Uh, I'll wait for Tuesday on this one. But we could ask, okay, I know how much distance it is. I know how much time it is. So I can ask for my rate. How much distance do I travel every second? Earlier on, I said the distance from one door to another is 10 meters. So I could put... Maybe it takes me five seconds to walk across. And then I can get a rate. How much distance do I cover every second? And that, I think, is a good next question. Although that's the start of chapter two. So I'll hold off till Monday. But that you'll probably recognize as, as speed. That's the, the start of it. Uh, let me give you another quantity. 
This will kind of change our discussion here. But we could ask something else. And as I walk across the room, not only could I ask how much distance do I travel and how much time do I take, but how much mass or how much material is actually then moving from one to another. If we go back to these cave people, you might be asking, all right, there's that antelope. How much, you know, what's the size of that antelope? If it's too big, I probably need help taking down that antelope. If it's not big enough, it might not be worth my time and it's not going to feed my whole family. I'll wait here for a bigger antelope to come along here or something. And so we begin to ask ourselves the size, how much material does it have? At this point, I'll just say weight, but I know all of you have taken your Physics 102. Is there a difference between mass and weight? Yeah, there is an important difference. We'll, we'll talk more about it as we, as we get there. So I'll just you keep using the word mass, but I won't distinguish between mass and weight. I need a symbol. Probably doesn't surprise you. Or maybe it does surprise you. What symbol do we use for mass? M. Didn't we already use an M? So be okay if I use a little m here? Because well, that's for a quantity and the other m's for a unit. Good. And I'm, I hope hopefully you noticed that, right? These are two different categories. One is a quantity, one is the, the units. And so make sure, again, you see that and then you'll never confuse that. Because if I were to write on the board here something like m equals or delta x equals 10m, do you see a difference between those? Right? Can you, can you see right away this is the quantity? This is saying the mass is, and I'll, I'll finish it here, but this one is saying the distance is. And then there's a number, 10 meters. And so, of course, having that number in front must mean it's a unit. Right? And so, Glad you noticed it. So don't be surprised if we use the same symbol many times in different categories. Okay? And so, uh, you know, we will. In fact, I think you guys are already familiar with the units for mass. What do we use? Yeah, grams. Uh, we can even put prefixes in front of it. I heard some of you say kilograms. That's the next thing I want to go with there. But in my case, I would be probably about 75,000 grams. And so, if I were to walk across the room, we could, you know, answer all three of those. How much distance is it? How much time does it take? How much mass is moving? How much material is moving from point one to point two? Okay. Well, in the interest of time and making sure I cover all this, I, I, I better move on here. But I think you're, you're seeing the idea. Uh, let's go to the, the second idea in the metric system that your author wants to emphasize here. And again, I trust it's stuff you've seen before here. But maybe it's a little different way. Let's look at what we'll call the prefixes. Let me just put centa here for a second. Centa. Uh, let me put over here Centa meter. Centa gram. Centa second. You can see why I called it a prefix. I'm putting it in front of words we've already seen. Maybe I'll change colors here. But I think you've noticed this, and if not, again, let me point it out, notice the setup of the metric system. Do you see these base words? The same ones we just did over here? And I know you've used the word centimeter before. What does it measure? What quantity? Does, does centimeters measure mass? Time? Length. Volume? Area? Length? Of course, you know it's length. I'm being silly here. But how do you know it's length? What if you had never seen the word centimeter before? Well, what's 
the root word behind it. Meter. So anything that measures length must have the word meter in it. That's the nice thing about the metric system. That and some other things here. But you've probably heard of millimeter. What does it measure? Length. Kilometer. What does it measure? Length. Maybe you've never heard of megameter, but what does it measure? Length. How about femtometer? What does it measure? Length. And I suspect for some of you, femtometer is a new word. But you know already it measures length. Why? Meter. It's got the meter. What does this measure? Centigrams. Mass, no question about it. It's got grams. What does this measure? Time. And so whether you've heard of those words before, it doesn't matter. They've got the root word in here. And so these prefixes that we're going to get to are called prefixes because we put them in front of the main unit and they're a multiplication factor. They make the base unit bigger or smaller. Uh, I think you guys already know what centa means. At least I think so. That's why I picked it. What does centa mean? What? It means one hundredth. So what does this word centimeter actually mean? Yeah. And so you are saying that this new unit of length, even if you've never seen centimeter before, the fact that you know what centa means and the fact that you know what meter means tells you that meter, it measures length, centa means it is a hundredth of a meter. So if I already know that a meter is about this big, then a centimeter is probably that big. Fair enough? even if I had never seen the word centimeter before. How about centigram? What would it be? Yeah, it is a hundredth of a gram. And if I never heard the word before, I know it measures mass because it's got the word gram in it. And I already know a gram is pretty small. By the way, a penny is about three grams. So if you can imagine cutting a penny into three pieces, a, a, a paper clip, one of the bigger paper clips is about a gram. And then I would have a hundredth of that. And that would give me some idea of what it is. Even if I'd never heard the word centigram before. How about centisecond? Same idea. It measures time because it's got second in it and it would be then a hundredth of a second. And so if I look at my stopwatch here, I see my stopwatch reads to a centa second. It reads a hundredth of a second. Yeah. And so there is the idea behind the prefixes. So by putting a prefix in front of any of our base units, we can make that base unit bigger or smaller. And so let's throw some of the more common prefixes up here. I just wrote in my notes the centa and the milla and the micro. Uh, getting bigger, I put the kilo, the mega, and the giga. You'll see here when you go through chapter one, they have a whole list of a lot more prefixes. I would suggest you at least learn that grouping right there. That, that's the most common ones. Commit those to memory. There'll be times where you'll come across things, as I mentioned, a femtometer, and you're going to go, Ooh, what is a femtometer? Now, more on that in a second here, but you can see right away than that the prefix is telling you it's the base unit and increased or decreased. So help me out here. What does milla mean? A thousandth, right? And so I know you've heard of things like millimeter. Millimeter measures length. I'll put it over here for a second. Millimeter. Uh, you might have even done milligram if you've taking any medicine or you know looked at a bottle bottle of Advil is an Advil like 200 milligrams of ibuprofen there so there it is it's in milligrams how much material uh, do you have uh, maybe I'll go to the other common what's killer 
that's a thousand and so again I know you've heard of a kilometer or pronounced kilometer in this country so there's the kilo of uh, these other ones may be a little less common you know what mega means uh, it's a million we go up by another three how about giga a billion yeah 10 to the ninth in fact maybe I should put it as 10 to the sixth and 10 to the ninth here's a billion uh, last one here, micro. What does micro mean? And that's one millionth. Yep. About 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the 3. And so those are what those prefixes are. And so we can make a whole list, and in the interest of time, I better not make the list any longer here. But I'm hoping you'll see then that we're going to take some base units and then put prefixes in front of them and so we may actually come up with the unit ourselves first then we may put prefixes in it and then increase or decrease the size of that unit and so how much we want to increase it or decrease it depends on what prefix we put in fact we have symbols for all these I bet most of you know the symbol for a centimeter what's the symbol for a centimeter CM? What do you think the M stands for? Meter. So what do you think the C stands for? Centa. And if you haven't heard it say this way, let me make sure you catch it. CM does not stand for centimeter. It's C for centa and M for meter. Well, isn't that the same thing? Yes and no. Because it actually means multiplication between them. See, if I were over here and I said, okay, I have this metal rod that is one point, well, let's do this. Um, 140 centimeters. This will be easier first. It's 140 centimeters long. How many meters is that? 1.4? How? Why? Because hopefully you took 140, then you took a centa, and then a meter. See, it's not cm for centimeter. It's C for centa. And centa is a number. And so you can either leave it as a symbol C or convert it to a number. But when you write CM, they are not grouped together. It is a C times a M. And so if I want to convert from centimeters to meters, it can't get any easier than this. Just substitute in the value of the C and you will get then the 1.40 meters. Fair enough? I'll go the other way. Maybe that's a little harder to go the other way, but what if I had 1.4 meters and I asked you how many centimeters is it? Well, it's 1.4, and it's meters. And I want to make it centimeters. Yeah, I'll multiply top and bottom by a centa. How hard can that be? It doesn't change anything. Group those together, and I got centimeters. Group those together, and I got the number. So this would be 1.4, and that centa means 100 centimeters. It's 140 centimeters. Now, since they're all multiplications and divisions by 100, most of this you can do in your head. Most of this you should just be able to shift the decimal. But let me say it again, in case you didn't catch it when you were younger, 
CM does not stand for centimeters. It's C for centa, M for meters. The rest of it logically falls in place. And therefore, we can start to do some units. We could even start to do some units you've never done before. I know you've done centimeters. I know you've done square meters. I know you've done cubic meters. What if I put the derivative of x with respect to time? I know you've done derivatives, but have you done units with your derivative? Have you done units with your integrals? How about logarithms? If I were to ask you what's the log of 10, you would tell me? One, right? Log base 10. Log of 10 is one. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> but what if I asked you, what was the log of 10 seconds? Mm, we got some learning to do. But let me point out, this is the point of today. You don't need to tell me what to do. I know how to handle it from the rules of algebra. The same mathematics that I was doing when multiplication with my numbers I did with my units. The same mathematics that I have been doing with my numbers I do with my prefixes. And so notice that whether it be a prefix or whether it be a unit or whether it be a number, they're the same properties of mathematics. You don't need to tell me that a meter times a meter is a meter squared. I can figure that out. I know how to multiply together. You don't need to tell me a meter times a meter times a meter is a meter cubed. I know that. I can figure it out. And likewise, oh, we'll wait for Monday on this. You don't need to tell me what the unit is if I take the derivative of a second. I can figure it out. And we'll wait for Monday before we go through that, but that's what I'm trying to set the stage. We're going to do a bunch of things you've never done before. You may not have ever seen it in class. You may not see it in the book. You may not hear me say it, and all of a sudden, there it is on the homework. Oh my gosh, what are you going to do? And that's why I keep saying this is a really good chapter to go back and look at what you have been doing and why you've been doing it the way you've done it. Because we're about to ask, what do I do next? <laughs> and so you've got to be able to be logically sound to answer that question. And so again, that's why it makes a really good first chapter, albeit a lot of review and a lot of students kind of blow it off as, oh, this is easy. And I hope that is the case. But this idea is really nice. So let me take this one step further. Uh, let me I'll clear off the board here. I've asked you on those last two problems to convert meters to centimeters and then the other one was, no I guess the first one was centimeters to meters and then the second one was the other way around. Let's go to area here. We, we've already been saying that this room is about 10 meters by 10 meters. So it has an area of 100 square meters. Fair enough? Maybe I should do like on that one, maybe I should start with what I would call the easier case. What if I told you it was 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters? Well, not the room is 10 centimeters, but some little rectangle I have that is, or square, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So the area would be 100 square centimeters. Could you tell me how many square meters this is? Now, let's come back here. Where did this come from? Wasn't it really 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters? So isn't this really 100 times a centimeter squared? 
And isn't that really a centa squared and a meter squared? And so maybe it's unfortunate that we write it this way because we really mean that. And then what that means is this is a centa squared and a meter squared. And a centa is one hundredth and I'll just square it. And there's the easiest way to convert from a square centimeter to a square meter. Put in the value of the centa. That's what I'm trying to say here. This has a numerical value. It is not CM for centimeter. It is C for centa and M for meter. Treat the C as it was designed to be treated. It is a number. It is a prefactor. Use the same rules of mathematics for the prefixes, the units, the numbers. And if I can get that straight to you, you're going to be able to do some much harder problems that you've never had to deal with before. And you will know how to do them because you've learned the mathematics of the numbers. Now I'm going to be asking you to take the mathematics and apply it to the units and apply it to the prefixes. And that's all I've done here. I've applied the square to the centa. It's 100 square. And so obviously one of those cancels with one of those and so it's 100th of a square meter. That's what I have. 100th of a square meter. And if it was up here and the question said how many square centimeters do I have? I would just simply go, all right, I would like that to be converted into square centimeters. So multiply top and bottom by square centimeter. There it is right there. There's the square centimeter. And so this is 100 and that would be 100th squared. And then this would be centimeter squared. That's how I convert it. I put a centa where I need it. And to make it mathematically valid, I got to put it to match. So I put a, <coughs> excuse me, a C on the top, but I got to put a C on the bottom. I got to put two of them. And of course, when I do that, this is a compound fraction. So that's 100 times 100 times 100. So that is 1 million. And so the floor space here is 1 million square centimeters. Fair enough? So again, hopefully not too boring, but also at the same time, see the thinking process. This is what you've been doing since elementary school. You've been looking at the prefixes. You've been multiplying them together. <coughs> hopefully you remember now that that really means multiplication. Just like the distance is 10 meters, that right there is multiplication. And now, once you realize that those all mean multiplication, then you could just apply the same rules of mathematics to the prefixes, to the units, as well as the numbers. And I know at this point in your education, you are very good with the numbers. I will just be asking you to do the same thing for the units. Usually in math classes, they spend a lot of time with the numbers, not so much time with the units. Well, I'll keep going. Maybe this will illustrate my, my point here. Uh, let's say after class, I head home and I go get some gas. Car's on empty and I pull into the gas station and uh, I don't know, is gas 250 roughly? Is it that low yet? All right, good. I, I certainly am enjoying the low price of gas. Uh, it's been very helpful and probably you too. But gas has dropped a lot. Let's just call it 250. But I pull into the gas station and I pump, let's just say, six gallons. How much do I pay? So it's 250 a gallon. I get six gallons. How much do I pay? 15 bucks? Well, it's the price. Yeah, the price is 250. Six gallons. 15 bucks, right? How'd you get that? You multiply? How come you didn't divide? Why'd you multiply? Because six gallons and each one is 2.5. All right. So, mentally, I hope this is what you're all thinking. You're thinking, okay, if I've never done this problem before, do I 
add 250 and 6? Do I multiply 250 and 6? Do I divide 250 and 6? Do I subtract? Oh no, I know what it is. I do an integral of 250 and 6. That's got to be the right one, right? So you've got to make this decision up front. You've got to look at the physical world and decide what process is going on and how that math is related to that process. And again, I know you've been doing this since third grade when you learned arithmetic. And so mentally you're saying, well, look, if I were to picture myself pumping the gas, one gallon would go in. That would be 250. Then the second gallon would go in. So that would be a plus another 250. That would be an additional 250. Then the third, then the fourth. And so hopefully in your mind you're thinking, okay, how much dollars is this going to cost me? Well, it's 250 and then 250 and then 250 and you're going to do that six times. And you already have told me that repetitive addition is multiplication. And hence, if nobody told you to multiply together, could you figure out that you're supposed to multiply? And so there's going to be your questions. They're going to get a little bit harder than multiplication. You'll see on, on Monday when we start chapter 2, I will ask you, well, what should we do? And one of those questions will be, you should take a derivative. <laughs> It won't be as simple as you should just multiply. I know you're good at multiplying. How are you at taking about derivatives? Do you know when and why you should take a derivative? I will also ask that question next Monday. And one of the other answers, I said, what should I do? And the answer should be, well, you should do an integral. Today, it's multiplication. But let's use all of our mathematics, including the most recent mathematics, is yes, there are times where that would mean take a derivative, or that would mean do an integral, or that would mean take its logarithm, or in this case, it means multiply, okay? And so again, that's kind of why we're kind of running through this, this basics idea here. So, here's what you are really saying. It is, <coughs> excuse me, 250 per gallon, and you are then multiplying it by 6 gallons. Right? And so, again, notice that I am going to do the same rules of mathematics. In this case, multiplication and division. Look what happens. Here's the number. Two and a half times six. Well, that's 15. But the big one I want you to see, and you've probably seen this in other classes, what do you get when you take a gallon? And you divide by a gallon. And if you didn't know, you should probably ask yourself, well, what would I get if I took five and divided by five? I know how to do it with numbers. Could I do it with units? So what's five divided by five? One. Sometimes we say cancel. All right. I guess that's okay. That's not probably the best answer because five divided by five is one. So what's gallon divided by gallon? One. One. So that becomes a one. And of course, one times 15 is still... 15. I think that's why we use the word cancel. It just kind of goes away. It doesn't really go away. It becomes a 1. And then when you multiply by 1 by 15, it's just your 15. What else is here? Dollar sign. Dollar sign. And so the answer is $15. And so again, notice I thought about the physical process and I come, came up with the equation. I then wrote it out and did the mathematics, not only with the numbers, but also with the units. And look at the end results. The end result came out to be dollars. Isn't it, shouldn't it? Because what's the question? The question says, how much does it cost? And so, cost would be measured in dollars. If I came out with something other than dollars, I should be very concerned. Fair enough? <laughs> So we call this unit analysis. You analyze the units. They should work out the same as your logic. This is a great check. When you sit down and you think about this problem and you ask yourself, okay, should I take a derivative? Should I take an integral? Should I multiply? And in this case, the answer is, oh, I should multiply. Well, then multiply and see what the units come out to be. Because if the units at the end do not match the same units that measure that quantity, 
then that's a clear indication that your logic is wrong. So checking your units, your unit analysis is what your author is trying to say here in chapter one. Do the unit analysis. The unit analysis will check your logic. Okay. Now don't make the units work out and then think, oh, it must be logically sound. Be careful with that. I would encourage you to think about the process. And when you think about the process, then that process will tell you mathematically, should I multiply? Should I divide? Should I add? Should I subtract? Should I take the logarithm? Should I take the derivative? Once you decide that, then do it. And follow your units through and see if the units match. And so that's what's meant by a unit analysis. Your units should match your logic. If they don't, it's a clear indication that your logic is off. And so I'll say it again. This part of this chapter is saying, make sure you use the same rules of mathematics for the numbers, the units, and the prefixes. Okay? And if you do that, I think you will go a long way in this. Oh, let's do a couple of other things here. A couple other things your, your author talks about here is he puts a couple of objects together. Uh, I think he has uh, three boards. Uh, they're all made out of wood. They're cut to different lengths. And so I'll just kind of put it on the board here. Let's take this first one and say this first board is 1.4 meters long. The second one, a little shorter, 0.75 meters long. And the last one is shorter still at 0.121 meters long. Alright, so there is our three boards. And he asked this question. If you stack them together, how long is the total? All right, seems like a simple question. Really, probably more of an elementary question. What process would you do? Would you multiply those three numbers together? Right, you're going to add them. Because you've learned, probably way back in first grade, that when you're talking about combining things, that is the process of addition. All right, so I'm going to combine these three together. Uh, pictorially, I guess it would look like this. I would have the longer one, uh, then the medium one, and then the next one, right? And I would start to add them together. And I would go 1.4 meters plus 0.75 meters plus 0.21 meters. When I add them all together, what am I going to get in terms of units? I mean, I know you know how to do the numbers, right? You've been doing numbers for a long time and you could have probably have done this back in for, well, it's got decimals, so second or third grade, where you're going to have to add a bunch of decimals together. And I know you can add the numbers, but what about the units? When this is all said and done, do I get meters? Cubic meters? Why meters? Now, careful, you, you're justifying the units because the quantity at the end is length. Right? But I want to justify the units and see if it matches at the end. So at the end, you're really saying at the end I better come up with meters because what am I asking? What's the question? Length. Total length, right? And length is measured in what? Meters. meters. So if I add those three, would it come out to be meters? If I had never done this before, how would I do it? Okay. I guess I would call this in your algebra class Factoring. Isn't that what you're doing? Right? And so, had I never done this before, I know that if I take three things of the same unit, meter, meter, and meter, and I add them together, what are my units at the end? Meter. 
because that's what the laws of algebra say. So again, not that you haven't done it before, and not that you didn't know the answer, but do you see what you've been doing? You have been using the rules of algebra with the units, as well as the numbers, as well as the prefixes. Keep doing that, especially as we get to ones you haven't done before. And so that's the way we would do it. It's the same reason why if I told you the distance was 10 meters, and the time is five seconds. Can I add those together? It makes no sense mathematically, nor does it make any sense physically. That's the beauty of it. The logic and the physics go together with the math perfectly. You wouldn't try to add these two together. Your physics answer would be they're different quantities. You don't put together length and time. And mathematically, you would say, you can't add these together. They're not like terms. You can't factor out the common factors and add the rest. There is no common factors. These cannot be added together. Fair enough? And they work beautifully together. And again, that's what your author is trying to illustrate here. And it's kind of set you up so that you'll be able to solve more complex problems here. And so now I can add these together. And in fact, this problem illustrates a second point here. Let's add those together. Now that we've just seen that the total would be measured in units of meters, Let's actually add this. What do you get when you take 1.4 and you add it to 0.75 and you add it to 1.25? Is that the right answer? Oh, shoot. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, uh, let me try that again. Anything, change anything else? Okay, is that the right answer? Now we're going to take a step further. I think everything I've been showing you right now is really the same thing you learned in a math class and the same thing you learned in a science class. Although, like I said, in your math classes, you've been doing them all mostly with the numbers. I know that uh, they throw in some uh, unit problems, and they should, and I know they throw in some prefixes as they should, but in a physics class here, in a science class, we will always have numbers and units and prefixes. And so my point for the last hour and a half has been Take something you haven't seen before. Come up with the equation yourself. Come up with the own units. You do that by applying the same rules of mathematics for the numbers, the units, and the prefixes. And if you can remember that, you will do quite well as we go forward from here. This is a little different. This is, might be something that you haven't seen in a math class. We only do this in science classes, and here's why. Mathematically, When you write down the number 1.4, mathematically you mean 1.400. In a science class, we don't quite mean that. These are called significant figures for those of you who are kind of catching on here. And so what do we mean by significant figures? Now watch this. When I go to measure that first board, I would get out a tape measure and measure, and when I say it's 1.4, do I really mean 1.4 exactly? No. There's no way that I can measure exactly 1.4000000000. My measuring device is not that accurate. So in the sciences, we have a slightly different approach. We mean something a little different than in a math class. When we write 1.4, here's what we mean. We mean that we have measured accurately to a tenth of a meter. What about that next number? The centimeter. 
Do I know that number? I didn't measure it accurately enough. In a math class or in a calculator, it treats it as a zero. So I like and prefer to write 1.4 this way. Here's what we mean in a science class. We do not mean it's 1.4 exactly. We mean it's 1.4 and who knows. And that's why the question mark goes there. Now the reason that's important here is because look at the second number. The 0.75 doesn't really mean 0 0.75000 like it would in a math class. In a science class, what it means is I've measured it to a hundredth of a meter, a centimeter, but the thousandth of a meter, the millimeter, I don't know. So I'm going to put a little question mark there because I don't really know that number. Now this third and last little board has been measured more accurately than the others. And I do know its length to the nearest millimeter, but not to the nearest tenth of a millimeter. So I'm going to put a question mark after that. Here's the important part then. If all you did was put these three numbers in your calculator and punch them in and hit enter, you would get this number. But what is wrong with that number? First board is that accurate? Yeah, there is no way that you should be telling me that the length is a one in the millimeters because you are adding numbers that you don't know. There is no way you know that number. So in a science class, that is wrong. That is not a correct answer. It misses the point of what we mean by our numbers. And that's why we have these rules, and this is the last little section of, of chapter one here. We call these significant figures. We've got to be careful with the way we represent our numbers. What do we really mean? Because they do look different than what they've been looking in your math class. And again, I don't think this is new to you. I'm sure you've come across this in your chemistry or your intro to physics class. And that's why I keep throwing that word significant figure. So I won't spend too much time here because I know actually in our science program, uh, we teach and heavily push significant figures in chemistry. So some of you have probably taken chemistry 155 and 156. Yes? No? Yeah? Others of you still have to take it. Um, but I know that you will be heavily penalized if you don't follow the significant rules correctly. Is that a fair statement? Good news here is I won't heavily penalize you. I won't even penalize you at all. I'll probably just write sig figs and say be careful. But I do want you to learn them and this is the reason why. The reason why here is that third number right there. I don't really know what it is. So when I look at this I would look at this and say, I'm just going to have to say that if I take those and add them together, I should get an I don't know. And in fact, even here, should I get an I don't know? Because I don't know what that number is. Now this one I do. And this one I do. And so what we tend to do is we tend to come over here and first just put them in our calculator. We say, well, let's, let's put them in our calculator and we get this 2.271. But that would only be the correct answer if those were zeros. And so these, I don't really know. And since I don't really know, what I'll do is I'll round it to the closest one I should know and then call the rest of them beyond that. I don't know. So since this 7 is higher than a 5, I'll round this up. And so the best answer I can give for this is 2.3. And I'll put some question marks here, which means 2.3. That's the correct answer. So do you see the difference between how you would do it in a math class and how you would do it in a science class? More importantly, do you see why? And so keep this in mind, anytime we start adding and subtracting numbers, you're going to stand back and find which one has the least precision. 
And so what we mean right here is that one we know. And we know it in every number. But the one beyond it, the hundreds place, we don't know. So there's no way that the answer can be any more precise than our least precise measurement. And that's how you indicate it. And so again, 2.3 does not mean 2.300 as it would on your calculator or in a math class. What it means is we don't know what that number is beyond there. And that's what you're trying to communicate. And so that's why we have these little rules called significant figures that allow us to treat our numbers a little different than in a math class. So, since we're getting low on time, let me just throw out multiplication here. If I had 1.21 and I multiplied it by, say, 12, what's the answer? And the rule we like to say here is, remember, 1.21 does not mean 1.21 exactly. And likewise, 12 may or may not mean 12 exactly. Sometimes we really mean exactly 12. Like if we said, hey, get a dozen donuts. Well, what does that mean? Well, 12 donuts, not 12 and a fraction that I don't know about. It, it literally is 12. So in that case, we would know these numbers and it would be 0, 0, 0. But other times, we don't know if it's exactly 12 and probably isn't if it's a measured. So do the mathematics as if there were all zeros at the end. And then realize that some of these numbers are more accurate than you can really justify because these numbers can only be known if these numbers were zero. And so the rule is we count how many significant figures are here. And so that's a little different than I did here for addition. Notice for addition, and I should say subtraction, I look for the least precision. And that's my answer. But for multiplication and division, I'm just going to count the number of significant figures. It's not perfect, but it's a good way to get started and say, let's just add these up. And notice that this one has three significant figures, but this one has two. And by having two significant figures, it means that that number right there would show up right there. The third place back. And there's no way then I should know what that number really is. So for me to say 14.52 would be a mistake. I don't really know it's a 5.2. So I will round it to two significant figures and call it a 15. Because it is really a 14 and change. Does that make sense? And that's the end of chapter one. A lot of review. I will let you go now, and for those of you who I uh, said come up and see me, uh, let's have a discussion here.